Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see all of you here. I'm John O'Neill, one of the pastors here at Grace. I'm with Pastor Jason Lucas and Pastor Stan Jacobson, and we're just delighted to have you here, especially if you're a, a guest this morning. And just a real quick uh, uh, announcement. If you know somebody that might enjoy this service, you're going to be doing this music tonight, right? 6.30 tonight. So come back and uh, join us for uh, some more of this great music. So I thought they'd really think they'd be doing a great job. Isn't that awesome? That's good. That's good. Yeah, as an old baby boomer, brings back lots of memories. Um, some I'd rather not remember, but... All right, so today we are continuing uh, with the story. And, and even though it's also, we're celebrating Pentecost today, and then Pastor Jason said that wonderfully, uh, but, uh, so Pentecost is the birthday of the church, but then in the story where we are, the Apostle Paul, uh, takes this message to, to the, all the corners of the earth. He converts many, many nations. He was the greatest missionary the church has ever known. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be the church that, that Paul worked so hard to develop uh, throughout his ministry? Well, there's a story of uh, a children's Sunday school uh, class that decided that they were going to play church. Okay, They're going to play church, and they were going to include a pastor, and, and a choir, or a band, and they had ushers, and, and the altar guild, and an organist, and all the things that, that make up church. And after a while, though, they got tired of playing the game. They just got tired, and so they decided they wanted to change it. They wanted to do something different. One of the other children uh, suggested that they play Jesus. And so uh, that sounded great, and when the other children asked the boy to explain the game, he said, well, one boy would play Jesus, and the rest of the kids would be mean to him, call him names, strike him, spit at him, tie him to a tree, and pretend to crucify him. Well, that took a bit of the glow out of the honor of playing the person of Jesus, but, uh, but they decided to go ahead. So after a few moments of absorbing and receiving the cruelty of the other children, the boy playing the part of Jesus called a stop to it. And in so doing, he uttered a profound statement. He said this, Let's not play Jesus anymore. Let's go back to playing church. You know, sometimes the shoe fits so tightly it hurts, doesn't it? Let's not play Jesus anymore. Let's go back to playing church. All of us, I believe, are painfully aware that there is a difference, and we know that that difference can be deadly. Playing church or playing Jesus. George Bernard Shaw saw the difference. Now, George was that brilliant, caustic British writer who, when asked about his religion, replied, I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> now, his answer was, was a little ambiguous, but never ambivalent. He bitterly attacked the church in some of his hypocritical stances, yet throughout his writing, it is evident that Shaw saw the potential and the power, the powerful force the Christian church could be if it were lived out with integrity and passion. For example, listen to what he once wrote. Now recognize his words are dated, but recognize also how prophetic they were. Here's what he wrote. If some enterprising clergyman with a cure for souls in the slums were to hoist a board over his church door with the following inscription, here men and women after working hours may dance without getting drunk on Fridays, hear good music on Saturdays, pray on Sundays, discuss public affairs without molestation from the police on Mondays, have the building for any honest purpose they choose on Tuesday, bring children for games, amusing drill, and romps on Wednesday, and volunteer for a thorough scrubbing down of the place on Thursdays, he could reform the whole neighborhood. George Bernard Shaw saw the church's greatest need, but also the church's unlimited potential. If the church of Jesus Christ becomes what he created it to be, a place that truly seeks to meet the needs of God's children, then the gates of hell will never prevail against it. But how do we move from playing church to playing Jesus? We know that we are called to be Jesus to our world, but, but how? 
Where do we begin? We begin by acknowledging who we are. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of the living God. We are the company committed by a, by a covenant and a cross. Now, the writer of Leviticus knew that's where we must begin. The Lord speaks to Moses in the second chapter of this book of priestly laws, and he says to him, Speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You must be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You see, the, the people of Israel never forgot who they were. And that's why they've been able to survive for, for 3,000 years under, under the most adverse circumstances. The law and the covenant that bound them together were not of this world. They were of God. And it bound them together as a people for 3,000 years. Paul addresses the same issue in his letter to the Corinthians. He writes, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. See, you are not just a social group. You are not a, a political party. You are a holy people. A holy people. Whenever the church forgets who it is, it loses its vitality. Our strength is renewed, first of all, when, when we are rooted in our dependence upon God, our total dependence upon God. Arthur J. Gossip once used this analogy. He says that for a long time, scientists in tropical lands could not determine how in even the longest droughts, when all the green things were burned up and the riverbeds were, were dry, that tiny little ants seem to build their little anthills with steaming, moist soil. Then it was discovered the secret. The secret was a carefully constructed shaft, which they dug downward into the earth, sometimes as much as 60 feet, to a perennial stream that no drought can touch. Each night, the whole busy little population hurried up and down the shaft, time after time, bringing life-sustaining moisture to the surface. Now that's a pretty good analogy to who we are as the body of Christ. Our roots go deep. They go very deep. We are the temple of the living God. His spirit dwells within us, and it's from God that we draw our life and our strength. We dare not stop here, however, or we will still be playing church rather than playing Jesus. It is clear that Christ calls us to be more than a shrine. The Christian church is not, is not a place, but a people. A people bound together in love and in mission. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church being torn apart by dissension. I'm reminded of the story of a shoe salesman who had shown a certain woman more than 25 pairs of shoes before she settled on the first pair that she tried on. As she paid for her purchase and was leaving the store, he said to her, thank you for coming in. I wish I had a dozen customers like you. One of the other clerks heard him, overheard him, and when the customer was gone said, you told her you wished you had a dozen customers like her? Why did you say that to such an overbearing and hard to please person? Because it's true, said the salesman. I have a hundred like her. I wish I only had a dozen. <laughs> it sounds like the church in Corinth had a hundred hard to please, disgruntled constituents. They were playing church. One group wanted to go this way. One group wanted to go this way. And they couldn't get together. And Paul scolds them pretty fiercely. After telling them that they are God's temple, he writes, If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. If God's temple is holy, or God's temple is holy, and he says that temple is you. One of Jesus' most important prayers also was, 
was that his followers would be one, even as he and the Father are one. Now, of course, every church has its problems, right? Every church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing. A popular psychologist was speaking at a pastor's conference, and as he introduced himself to each pastor, he would say, I'm sorry to hear about the problem in your church. Now, half of the pastors responded, well, it was there before I came. The other half responded, but it's getting better. It's improving. However, one fellow responded, what problem? After playing golf with this pastor later on, the psychologist discovered that he also lied about his golf score. <laughs> Every church has its problems. All of us have our own ideas of how to, how to further the kingdom of God. Sometimes those ideas are hard to match. But we are one body. And we can't afford to lose a finger or a hand or a foot or a leg. We are one body. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to play Jesus as opposed to playing church, we have to work together, pray together, strive together in unity and common purpose, and never lose sight of the fact that even though we may disagree, we are still one body in Christ. But there's one thing more we need to say if we're going to be playing Jesus. It, it's not enough to love God, and it's not enough to love one another. We must also love the world for whom Christ died. That's what the whole Pentecost and the speaking in the different languages is all about. We are to love the world. The writer in Leviticus was the first one to record God's command that we are to love our neighbor. But the boundaries of that love continue to expand throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And in the words from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus even counsels us that this life of love is even to extend to our enemies. Our enemies, for crying out loud. We're supposed to love them too. But, but it remained for St. John, the last of the Gospel writers, to instruct us that God so loved the world. The world. It is not enough for the body of Christ to love God or one another. Somehow, we must learn to love the world. A man came out of church one day and said to his pastor, I love God so much that I'm ready to choke anybody who dares to speak a word against him. Well, we can chuckle about that, but, but that kind of attitude is wrecking the world today. Muslims and Jews, Protestants and Catholics, communists and capitalists, Democrats and Republicans are all willing to choke anyone who disagrees with them. And can you see that, that this is playing church and not playing Jesus? Jesus set out not to choke the wayward, but to, but to embrace them and to tell them the good news that they are loved and that they are forgiven and that they are part of God's family. And that is our task as well. We are called to take the love that we ourselves have received and share it with the world. That's what Jesus did, and that's what we must do as well. The great preacher of old, Charles Spurgeon, once used this analogy. He said that if a single wasp discovers a deposit of honey or other food, he will return to his hive and impart the good news to his companions who will sally forth in great numbers to partake of the fare which has been discovered for them. Spurgeon then asks, Shall we who have found honey in the rock of Jesus Christ be less considerate of our fellow human beings? Ought we not rather hasten to tell the good news? Ralph Stockman once wrote, I once met a woman who came out of a religious service all aglow, and she said, I love everybody. After a little conversation, I discovered that there were some specific exceptions to her love. She made me think of those old-fashioned woolen mittens that we used to wear. They kept the hands warm, but the problem was you couldn't pick up anything while you were wearing them. Love for God 
They seem to warm our hearts. But it's not real unless it helps us to take hold of our neighbor's needs. Playing church or playing Jesus. I think you know the difference. We are the temple of the living God. We are the body of Christ. We better not let anything tear us apart. But neither must we stray from our central reason for being, and that is to tell the world, as the Apostle Paul did, that in Jesus' name, it is deeply, deeply loved.